our virtual comparative genomics workshop. The Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, the University of Florida, and the National Science Foundation sponsor our research group to give two or three day workshops covering this material at the University of Florida and other institutions. IFAS, UF, and NSF have also sponsored the creation of this series of video lectures. The senior personnel giving these lectures are the PI Dr. Andrew Hanson and co-PI Dr. Valerie de Crecy Lagarde. Dr. Svetlana Gerdes, who also participates in these lectures, is a highly experienced genome annotator, well-versed in metabolism and familiar with the seed. Together, Dr. Hanson, Dr. De Crecy, and Dr. Gerdes created this workshop's material. Assistant instructor Dr. Basma El Jacobi also participated in this lecture. Dr. Claudia Lermautis introduced and assembled this virtual lecture. Questions made by Dr. Monica Oli. This is the second in our series of videos and it is entitled Using Comparative Genomics Resources. This lecture is divided in two parts. First, we will cover the use of the string database to predict gene function. In the second part, we will provide you with a resource model and explain its great utility. The String Comparative Genomics website is a program created by the group of Drs. Pierre Bohr, Christian von Mering, and Lars J. Jensen. You can visit them at string-db.org. This program's creation, capabilities, and improvements are described in their paper String V9.1, Protein-Protein Interactions Networks with increased coverage and integration. Published by a joint effort of scientists from Switzerland, Denmark, Germany, and Italy. In Nucleic Acids Research 2013. The resource ma is a directory of websites and active links which our team constructed to aid scientists in their research in comparative genomics. It is a list of the platforms and programs which help you to do multiple sequence alignments and phylogeny. Transmembrane and organelle are targeting predictions. Or to get information about protein structures and families, conserved domains and motifs, and enzyme as well as metabolic pathways. We also provide a directory of plant phenome, metabolome, and proteome databases, and much more. To start our exercises, please go to our lab website. Type 1C page 1 in Google. Click on Lab webpage Horticultural Sciences. You are now in Andrew Hanson's page. Click on the Lab tab. Then click on Workshop 1. This will take you to our workshop page. We're going to go first to the string document, and after that we'll talk a little bit about resource more, very briefly, but go to string first. And when you're on that page, open the string database itself in a new tab. So you've got the string open as well as the, the class web page. And Notice that all these class documents that we're talking about have a link here to a printer-friendly document, so you can print it out as a Word file. It will look like this. And if you haven't already done that, or didn't realize you could do that, that's a really good thing to do. Has everybody got their string open in a separate tab from US? So. As we said, String is a really good place to start a comparative genomics project. 
it's a, all pre-computed, which means there's nothing new as a, a user can change about it. And it tries to explore, or it sets out to explore, functional relationships between proteins, these relationships that we've been seeing before in the what we just talked about, clusterings, fusions, co-occurrence. It also tries to integrate experimental data like protein-protein interactions and actually even specific experiments on that gene. And then, the thing it's really neat, it tries to give you an integrated confidence score for the associations it predicts. So it puts these on a number from a 1 to 0. 1 is certain. You know, below 0.4 is very iffy. But it will try to give you a weighted kind of impression as to how strong it thinks a relationship is. And the first thing we're going to do to practice using it is to rediscover that Nudix enzyme FOLQ in Lactococcus lactis. And we're going to do that by entering one, you can enter the string in a couple of ways. One is via a protein name. So what I want you to do is leave open this tab with the, my web page on it. The default face page of the string is this blue colored thing with protein name search, but you've got tabs to search by protein sequence. We'll lose those in a minute. So what I want you to fill in in protein name is the name FOLP. The capitals and that don't matter. That's just one of the folate synthesis genes. It's actually pretty well the central gene of folate synthesis, so if you were looking a priori for genes associated with folate synthesis, this is probably the one you'd pick. And then you can just search the whole collection of genomes in the string, or you can use this pull-down tab to select the genome specifically you want to search, and I want you to use the tab, pull it down, scroll down to Lactococcus lactis MG1363. And then when you're there, you highlight it, press select, and then it will light up in your box. So I want everybody to get to there before we push any more buttons. Okay, so when you when we've all got that, then click go. And up will come this sort of trapezoid picture. Do we all have something like this on our screen? One thing to notice about these trapezoid things is that you can kind of move them around to, to disambiguate the relationships, which can be very helpful. But let's just look at what we've got here. This is a network of predicted functional associations based on different kinds of evidence. And we're looking at an evidence view here where different line colors represent the types of evidence. So for example, a blue line represents co-occurrence. A red line represents gene fusion, which is always weighted very strongly by string, as it should be, with strong evidence. A green line is what they call neighborhood, which is what we've been calling clustering on the chromosome. And yellow lines are text mining, where they're looking at the literature. Black lines are co-expression, there aren't any of those. So roughly speaking, the more lines you've got going between two entities in the network, the stronger the relationship is. And we went in, remember, we went in with the gene FOLP, which is the central folate synthesis gene. So not unexpectedly, it's picking up other genes in the folate synthesis pathway, FOLB, HPPK, otherwise known as FOLK, FOLC, and two of the three paraaminobenzoate synthesis genes, which is part of the folate synthesis pathway. So already this is a very nice example. It's picking up very strong relationships between the FOLB and the synthesis pathway. But look, it's also picking up pretty strong relationship with FOLQ, which we now know is the missing paraphosphatase in the folate synthesis pathway. Now, we know that 
and it's now called Fold Q. But if we'd done this a couple of years ago, it wouldn't have been called Cold Q. It would have been called YOGG. But you have to be careful because, yes, because it's there's text mining. So you have to mining. try again without text mining and see if it comes up. Well, we're not going to do it now, but it, <laughs> it used to do. Yeah. It used to do. Because now that he's published, there's this link can be brought, the comparative genomic evidence, but it's based on. So this would not have been there when he did the work five years ago. How do you turn off one of the functions? We'll do it. I don't guarantee it's going to show what we want to show. But you see this box got the arrows in oh, it? If okay. you turn off, we can mm -hmm. have text mining and databases. Yeah. Turn yeah. off those two and then put update parameters. Well. Yeah, yeah, still sure. these. Still, yeah, it used to, it used to do. Mm -hmm. Came up very well, still stays But there. pedagogically, you don't want to have text mining. Yeah, yeah? No. okay. No. If you... Look at some of these genes. Well, these are all genes in the network. They have little structure pictures in them. Those are ones for which a 3D structure is available. And if you click on them, let's just click on one at random, it will give you a link to the structure. Very nice. But If, for example, fold Q, just, just go to our friend fold Q, that doesn't have a structure, at least not for this organism, but it does tell you here that it's a nudix protein, and this is a family of paraphosphatases, and you can get the protein sequence, and you can search for homologs. So this is a very, you know, kind of connected database. You can go to Unifrot, which is a very good database from here. Oh, yeah, that's that tab there. Yeah, you can go to Unifrot. So let's just look a little bit more at the tools here. You see this little table here has bullets in it. The first column in the table is neighborhood, which is their word for clustering. The next column is fusions. The intensity of gra on the gray scale of the, the bullet is a measure of their estimate of its strength. But all these scores here are uh, well above 0.4. So if we wanted to see more associations that might still be meaningful, we can go down to that little box at the bottom and ask for, for example, no more than 20 interactors and leave our cutoff at 0.4, which because that will exclude the really probably very weak ones, and then update. And that will give you a larger network, which will actually start to include some other things which make sense. Looking at it here, Fold D, which is a folate metabolism enzyme, isn't in that first network. But when you go to the second one, Fold D is is in there pretty strongly. So you see your expanding outwards to relationships which still remain meaningful. Now, we were having a little conversation before this started about sometimes it's quite hard to dig out of this database why it puts a high score on something. But you can see a lot of evidence if you want, a lot of it, not all of it, I think. But you see this one, for example, it's saying often in the neighborhood. Now you can examine that evidence by hover over the bullet and click neighborhood. And now you begin to see just how powerful this system is because this is a phylogenetic tree of, of actually of life and it's showing you the major groups. These are only summaries of the major groups for the moment but it's showing you the major groups, eukarya, different kinds of bacteria in which our gene of interest, which was Fold P, is in the neighborhood of, i.e. clustered with a brown or orange colored gene. And you can mouse over that to check it. See, that says Fold P. That one says, it says HPPK, uh, not Fold E. But anyway, still a folate synthesis gene. Now, if you push the expand all button, 
instead of seeing just a summary of the organisms in which these genes are clustered, you see the whole collection. So if you scroll down, so have you, are you all on that page, seeing these, these two genes clustered in many genomes? And when there's a little triangle between them, it means there's an intervening gene. When there isn't one, it means they're contiguous. And an important point here, remember this database gave this gene a very high confidence score of being related to the gene we went into, based largely on clustering. Well, the reason it's giving it such a high confidence score is that this clustering is happening in very diverse genomes, taxonomically. I mean, that are, I don't know, hundreds of thousands, certain maybe a billion years apart in evolution. And that's when a clustering relationship becomes persuasive, is the more genomes it's in that are very diverse. It doesn't matter that it's clustered in 50 different versions of E. coli. Uh, that's not necessarily significant. It is significant if it's clustered with the same gene in very different organisms, because that then tells you that the churning of the genomes that goes on in which, you know, operons are taken apart and put back together all the time in bacterial genomes, they're in flux. If genes in different organisms, very different, tend to stay together, it's because there's something pushing them together. The mere fact that a gene is next to another gene in a given organism doesn't actually mean anything because if you think about it logically every gene has to have a neighbor one on each side and if I'm a close relative you know if I've got two bacteria one of which is a close relative of the other one what's on either side of it may be more a function of just relationship inheritance from the same ancestor than of any major force driving them together. But if I go further apart in evolution than just a closely related organism and those genes are still staying together, especially if, for example, they flip strands, so now the genes are po pointing in different ways or change orders, that's then becoming persuasive because it's saying there is something driving them to stay together other than just shared ancestry. And this is a beautiful case. So come back out of there back to the main screen and just click on the little box that says gene fusions the second one down that will show you cases where two genes are fused so here again we're looking first an overview of what where fusions are when they're not joined together, they're not fused. They're present in the genome, but not fused. Where they're joined together, they're fused. And actually, you can see here that they're only fused in a rather narrow group of extreme halophilic archaea, actually. So that's a persuasive, but it's not as persuasive as if the fusion had occurred more widely across the tree of life. OK, so that's the beginnings of an introduction to string. Let's go back out, back to the face page. And we're going to do a little exercise. In that case, we rediscovered this Nudix enzyme that was missing in Lactococcus lectis. We're now going to do an example in which we find the E. coli equivalent of FOLQ. And we're going to do it by going into the string with a different, in a different way. We're going to go in with a protein sequence. So go back to your class page, scroll down to example two, and capture the E. coli GTP cyclohydrolase one. So on one. the Mac, it's Apple C, if you want to copy, not control C. So copy the sequence and go back to the face page. Here, click on the tab, search by protein sequence, paste it in. And now I want you to select the organism Escherichia coli K12 MG1655 from the list. So you go Escherichia coli K12 MG1655, select. So go now push go. And when you get to the page, 
you need to go down and increase the number of interactors to 20. Okay, so there's your first page. I've got that. Then you click continue. And let's all get to here. When we've got to here, to see what we need to see, we have to increase the interactors. So go down to the bottom and do what we did before. No more than 20 interactors, update parameters. So what I wanted you to see here is that although it's not strong and has been strengthened by actual data, there is a neighborhood link between folly and nud b. Okay? Now, what is nud b? Well, the nud part might give you a clue. It's one of the, I think it's about 14 nudix genes in E. coli genome, so you could mouse over it. And it's called, this is typical of nudix enzymes, it's a DATP pyrophosphorylase, but it also catalyzes this step in, in folate synthesis, and it's been shown to be that. Now, if we'd done this search as we used to do, before Nud B had been shown experimentally to be the folate synthesis gene, the equivalent of FOLQ in Lactococcus, you would have found of, of the 14 genes in E. coli, only one of them would have shown up in this network as a candidate. Okay? Well, that's a big help because if you've got 14 genes as candidates, and one of them is showing up in a network as being correlated with your folate synthesis genes, that's clearly your best candidate. And in fact, this gene's function was assigned in the end by Morris Bessman's lab in a brute force approach in which they said, one of these nudix genes in E. coli, the 14 of them, must be the folate synthesis one. It wasn't specially homologous to the lactococcus one, so they couldn't use just homology. This is a good example of where Homology didn't really tell them which one of the 14 it might be because the lactococcus one was too diverged. So there's no clear candidate from homology with the known enzyme. So then you go to comparative genomics, you've got a good candidate. But they just did it brute force. They took all 14 and tested He hasn't taken this. our class yet. They but he was interested more generally in all of them. So it made sense that he cloned them and expressed them anyway for his yeah. general purposes. Oh, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't solely. It was a brute force approach. And you could have used comparative genomics to guide you more quickly to the answer. Just what you might as well do here, go back to the face page there. And um, there's a useful link at the bottom that many of you will know, but those of you who are not primarily microbiologists might not. E. coli wiki. Just open it in a new tab. So if you want to know something about an E. coli gene, then you just go here and you put, for example, nud B in the box, and it will give you a summary about it. It will also give you links to expression data and so forth. But here you see it's giving you the same annotation as the string did. In some cases, this will give you more complete information than string does. So it's just a, it's just a good place to know exists. All right, close that window and scroll down to example three where we're going to rediscover the link between that COGO354 protein and iron sulfur proteins. And here again, we're going to enter by a protein name. And the protein name we're going to enter with is YGFZ, which is the name, the systematic name of the COGO354 protein in E. coli. So go to your stream page, back out to the face, Search by name, YGFC, and again, pick E. coli K12 MG1655 in the organism. E. coli K12 MG1655, select, and then go. Then go down and increase to 20 interactors. So do you see this one now? So here's our YGFC protein in the middle. 
it's got its little picture of a structure which tells you this protein has a 3D structure in the database. Notice that there are actually two on sulfur relationships in this network. One of them is the MIA B protein up here. Remember we said that that was an iron sulfur protein and the other one is ERB A which is also iron sulfur. This is a good one to show them the enrichment tab that you've never shown but it's really cool on that one. If you go to advanced, the little tab, advanced tab right here. I'm in your hands here, Ben. Let's see how well you're going to do. You go to enrichment, the fourth tab from the left, and you can choose biological process, molecular function. You can click. The second one works for you. Molecular functions? Yeah. It gives you basically these are the enrichment of the genes. Because you have these gene names, you don't know what they do, you don't really recognize them. Okay, so what I want you to do is go back, close the um, go term thing, and go back out to the face page. And the default in string is to open with this blue bordered screen, which is where you're searching for specific proteins. But you have another option, which is to search for the cog, or that's one of these protein family classifications, as we said, to search for the cog to which your protein belongs. Now, that's a broader kind of search than the specific protein. You're asking, what other members of this family am I seeing associations with? So remember that in all these databases, like a PFAM domain, or a CDD domain, or a cog number domain, these are based on sequence similarity. They don't mean the same function. They frequently embrace proteins that have related functions, but different ones. So a cog, a cog doesn't mean same function. It means similar structure, which may mean similar function. So just change the search to pink. If you see pink, you're in cog search. And again, you just do auto detect with the cog search. This may take a little longer. Then just leave the organism blank and hit the cog search. And it's hitting what you would expect because we know that this protein belongs to COG0354. And it's giving you some examples of the members of that cog. And notice it's already been called folate binding protein. That's because work's been done on it by us and others that showed it was. So now leave the radio button on and go to the bottom of the page and ask for continue. And it's important here Notice that this particular, have you got this screen, everybody? Mm -hmm. Notice that these particular things are really dominated by text mining and databases, mm -hmm. which we don't want to see at this point. So unclick the text mining and databases in the little table underneath. Update parameters. And these are. Let's say these are results that are uncontaminated by what's known. So this is frontiers. We're just ignoring what's known and asking what other things are out there that the system can detect that isn't published or in databases. Well, one thing that you see here is an association with COGO. So it's all among all, all associations among, among, among COGs now, which are families, broad families of proteins. Or NOGs. I'm trying to remember what NOGs are. Are they eukaryote COGs? Yeah, they're, they're, they're a derivative of COG anyway. And what you see is a relationship with 0494 over here, which is, and it's a strong one, and that's NTP phosphohydrolases, including oxidative damage repair enzymes. Uh, actually, that's our Nudix family, but you're getting this oxidative damage repair link, and remember that's what we concluded COGO354 was doing, it was oxidative damage repair to iron sulfur clusters. So that's just to show you that if you switch to the COG mode of searching, you can pull in more things to explore, knowing that they're looser 
connections potentially and may be more likely to need close scrutiny just because a cog is not a specific function or protein, it's a family of proteins which can have different functions. So let's go back to the last exercise. Go back. I, I do want to emphasize that we're showing you this after the fact and it's always easy to see when you know the answer, but it's actually what's difficult is here you have 10 different relationships. And the one that's actually the most significant is the last. And when you start, you don't know, so you look at the 10, and it means it's a lot of work sieving through data before you kind of see that a similar association comes from different. So you, you have these 10, none come out, and then you do some other stuff and you see iron sulfur again. And then you start to say, oh, but it's, it's, it's a long process. You know, when we teach it, it looks easy, but actually it's not. No, you have to be persistent. It doesn't, because people think, I have that all the time when I give a talk, they say, oh, it's so easy, why didn't we figure it out before? Because it was in the noise, you know. And when you're in the noise, you have to really get in there, put your teeth in there. And it's the same with this type of stuff. Yeah. Same thing here, they tell, well, they tell you which organs need to start with. Yeah, yeah, well, usually you don't. In that little scheme, how the information yeah, actually, that, that, thank you for raising that point, Vasma, because we, we're going in and searching with um, convenient model organisms, and, and that's a good place to start, because that's where your databases, your other supporting information the is the best. Um, broadly speaking, you get similar networks regardless of what organism you try, but they are not identical. And you may get clues from one organism that you don't get from your model. So if you are using this in a real project, I would still say start with the models. If your gene occurs in a model organism, a model cyanobacterium, a model gram plus, a model gram minus, start with that but then explore other organisms in which it also occurs. And I, I mean, poke my, around the tree my strategy yeah, has been to poke around the tree of yeah. life. I mean, <laughs> look to see where it occurs and take one organism. If it's in actinobacteria, take one of those. If it's in trypanosomes, take one of those, and so on. And if it's in gram negatives like E. coli, one of those, but maybe a couple of those, actually, just there. So, so that's really important. It's, we're showing you in a nutshell what it can do when it's really rolling, but it's actually more laborious than that. So for the last exercise, we are going to think about a protein which is, until I guess <laughs> this year, was really a mystery. It is now known what it does. I want you to go back to the proteins mode. So your screen should just click proteins, it should go blue and I want you to search by protein sequence and go to the class page and capture under example 4 copy the sequence of the IOJAP protein now this is a really enigmatic protein until recently its name IOJAP comes from the plant world actually maize genetics it's short for Iowa Japonica it was a gene identified in maize I think about 60 years ago as causing a kind of striped chlorosis, stripy leaves with loss of chlorophyll in, in rows of cells. And yet when we had genome sequencing it turned out that this was everywhere. I mean all, many prokaryotes, all eukaryotes have this thing. And in addition it's very strongly associated with different kinds of genes which point to its function. Despite that, for 50 years its function remained elusive, now it's known somewhat what it is. But we're going to hypothesize a function for this using the string. So use the protein search mode, paste your sequence into the box, and um, again, we're going to select an organism which is particularly informative it's Geobacter metalliridusens. So in your pull down, Geobacter metalliridusens. Select it and go. When you get that page, click on. 
Okay, so do you all see a diagram like this? Notice that the great majority of these things are based solely or almost solely on neighborhood, but there's one really strong fusion as well. So you both with the gene NADD, which is a biosynthetic enzyme in the synthesis of cofactor NAD and ADP, this is in a neighborhood or fused in a lot of genomes, and you have you don't get much better score than 0.993. So just to explore that, click on the little bullet that says gene fusion, and you'll see the fusion is in right at the top in proteobacter. If you want to expand, you can expand individual taxa here by clicking on the boxes, but I just do expand all and see how frequent it is in proteobacter, proteobacteria. I'm actually just seeing it in a couple here, here, and here, but that's still quite uh, interesting because they're, they're not that closely related, actually, these. One and the sulfur spirit on the Della Vibrio are not really really close so you've got you've got some nice fusion evidence go back and click on the neighborhood evidence and again look we won't expand the whole thing but it's this classic case where it's showing up in the neighborhood across pretty much the bacterial family tree so this is a very robust clustering relationship it's not just in a narrow taxon it's why? So there's clearly some kind of relationship with NAD in this gene, and that's what we're still hypothesizing, but we have absolutely no idea what it is. is that oh, I have an idea, but it's not good. Well, Valerie has an idea, but no evidence, and it, it's so strong that we thought it must have something to do with NAD biochemistry, and Andre Osterman and we had the same idea and tested things, and it was wrong. And now the function is in, it's in a translational well, what, what, machinery. What, what other association do you see that's very strong apart from this NADD, from a network? If you go down and if you know translation, the first one is a modification of related translation. The third one are these GTPases related to translation. The fourth one is a ribosomal protein. The other one is a ribosomal protein. This is a ribonuclease is involved in RNA processing. So there's two strong, strong, strong interactions. This NADD that we all got clued on, but we always said, and it's related to translation. So the paper that just came out is a beautiful paper. They found that this protein replaces one of the subunits of the ribosome called L14 in stationary phase and inactivate translation. It's a translation inhibitor in stationary phase. So this is published. My idea of why this is linked to NAD and we're totally hand-waving is that I think, think about it, you have a regulatory protein that inactivates or deactivates the ribosome. How does it sense the fact that it has to replace? In the paper, they don't discuss it, they just say, uh, what your job replaces L14 and inactivates the ribosome. I think this is actually a post-translational modification that takes or part of NAD and adenylates the, the protein so that it senses the NAD status and it knows when to inactivate. I think this thing actually does a modification and put it on the protein. This is my latest hypothesis. I have to email the guys who did the paper to know if they're doing that. It's a next step, because if you have something that inactivates in bacterial physiology, it has to sense something. And the NAD is so strong, so maybe it's not a modification, but is, I think it's a clear link to metabolism. And NAD uh, metabolism is a way to sense stationary phase or exponential phase. So this is my idea, but uh, it hasn't been tested yet. I have to email the guys, I haven't done it yet. So a sort of conclusion is that this is really the elephant in the room. I mean, there may be a translational function that's been assigned, yeah. but whatever the final explanation of, the, of what this protein does has to include, has to include some rationalization for this link because yeah. it's too strong, far too strong to be coincidental. And that's the string. I want to take you now to just to see, clo close the string, and from... Uh, the, the string page, go back to the face page there, 
for the workshop and look on click the resource symbol which means to equip you with resources basically and this page is a large collection as Valerie said updated because I updated every year for my biodramatic class in the fall and then Andrew updated okay. every year for this class so pretty much it's updated well, twice and, a year. and for my own class yeah, so yeah. it gets about three updates, three updates a year, a year yeah. And we also prune out stuff that yeah. doesn't seem to be worthwhile anymore. So it's not just growing forever. Mm -hmm. It's somewhat selective. <laughs> and all the links, <laughs> pretty, I mean, 99% 90, of the links will work. We, we, we're worried about link rot. So <laughs> just to walk you through this, I mean, many of these will be familiar with, but we have a whole host of general resources, including things like the links to the SGD, the, the yeast genome database, translation tools. Incidentally, this French site, ABIM, is a really good one because it tells you online sequence analysis tools listing and it's pretty well curated. So if you want to know how to do something and an ordinary Google search doesn't tell you, try going to uh, ABIM. I always do a plug for this. I don't know how many people know Multiline as an alignment program. Who, who doesn't know and use Multiline? Okay. You should. It's great. It's, another, it's a French site, quite old now. It's really nice output in color. It's quick. It does crude phylogenetic trees. I love it. The best thing about Multialign is it doesn't really care about your input format, whereas a lot of the cluster W, if you have any hidden characters, any whites that you don't see, you can't do your alignment. Multialign just doesn't care. It takes whatever you feed it. Yeah. And I know for my undergrad class, that's what we get stuck on the pasting, the <laughs> hidden characters and all that. Multi-align, you can put anything. Yes, that is very, it also allows you to, once you've done an alignment, it allows you to add the sequences one by one to the alignment, and that can actually really be helpful because sometimes the alignment's first time won't do it right. So you start out with a core that did it right, and then you can stick others on it, and it will do it correctly. Also, I mean, this is... Another French site I'm plugging here. <laughs> I mean, I wish I could plug somewhere else, but it's, they're just the best. I mean, phylogeny.fr. Who knows this one? Who doesn't know phylogeny.fr? Okay. This is an excellent place to draw professional quality phylogenetic trees, and it has literally what they call a one-click phylogenetic tool. You know, you've got to put a sensible input into it. It doesn't do miracles. But it doesn't require you to make a series of choices, and it will give you maximum likelihood trees. Yeah, and it's flexible. You can actually be much more advanced or not, depending on your level. And there again, I hunted a lot for my undergrad class, for one that was undergrad proof. And this yes. is the one that really was. Yeah. Yeah. How many people know Mega or don't know Mega? This is a free, downloadable, uh, upgraded constantly. And they have very good tutorial books. Actually. Excellent tutorial, straightforward to use, phylogeny and tree drawing program. It's got Clustal W and um, Muscle built into it as modules, so you don't have to do this trick of you know doing your alignment and then exporting the file and putting it in the tree. It'll do it seamlessly. Those are the two I use all the time, and I teach them especially the phylogeny FR, but they're really good. Okay. In the organella targeting predictions, this is sort of plant-oriented here now, but these are very helpful. There are three really good ones. Target P, Predator, again French, this is in Denmark, and PSORT, which is in Japan. Those are the three industry standards for predicting. And there's another one which comes out of, I think this is Switzerland, Cosmos. It does ambiguous targeting. In other words, it looks to see, could this be plastid and mitochondrion? And it's actually quite good. I haven't tested that one. Yeah. should go. Cosmos. Long-range homology searches. Fire and Cypred are both structure prediction programs, higher order structure, that's tertiary structure prediction based on primary structure. So they are capable. If you have a protein that you don't really know what family it might belong to, you put it in these and it will tell you not by 
simple amino acid sequence homology, but by model structure, what family does it belong to? So sometimes this allows you to place something in a family that otherwise you couldn't. Okay, protein structures. Anybody not know the PDB, protein database? You probably know it better than me. Yeah, PDB is really the worldwide repository of all structures. And when you publish a structure, you have to also deposit your structure in PDB. So that's when it started that way. But on top of that, they have an amazing team that does a lot of analysis on top of these structures. So they group them in family. You can look for keywords. You can look. It's a really searchable structure database that we use all the time. Yeah, and people are increasingly using the structures that are in there of a known protein to model mm. their protein onto and try to see, well, what might be the substrate that mine does because it's different to the known structure of the one whose substrate is defined. Again, you know target track, Valerie, better than me. Oh, the tar yeah, this yeah. is, you have a lot of structural genomic efforts, especially in the States, but in Japan and in France, and they... They have pipelines of proteins and structure. So you can, this is the depository of all the proteins that are in the pipeline. So you can ask, is my protein in the pipeline? Sometimes there's a structure. Sometimes they say, we have a protein expressed. And normally, but it doesn't work right, you can go and ask for the clone that expresses this protein. So you can actually get an expressing clone without doing any cloning. It's also the best place to find, if you have a protein sequence, it's the best place to find is there a structure of something related to this, because you yes. can do a blast. You can also do that in, 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 the, CBI. in, in CBI. Yeah, yeah but this, this gives it yeah. to you. Mm -hmm. yeah. We talked about the COG database, the PFAM database, and the conserved CD, C, that's wrong, it shouldn't be CCD, it should be CDD. CD, yeah. uh, those are the ones we just mentioned at the start. I want to mention SEC2REF for a second because we just discovered it quite recently. So one thing you struggle all the time is you start with a protein in Geobacter. But you want to know, is there any literature on any homolog of this protein? And the only information you have is GO22562 and a sequence, pretty much. So this is something from Nick Grishin's lab, and what you do is you can't do it on the fly, and you send it out and they send you an email. They blast and find anything with a reference. So if you have a homologue of your protein on which there's a paper published, it'll pick it up. It also catches uh, structures, if there's structures. So now it's the first thing we do on any protein family. It's not totally up to date, so if you have a paper that just came out, like last month, it might not get it, but we find it's really great. When you start with a protein you don't know anything about, do that. You'll catch all the papers that have been published on that family. It does it better than, than PubMed. Of course, <clears throat> for those of you who are metabolically oriented, we're going to be using when we get to the seed, you'll see that it's linked to the KEG database, Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes. Who doesn't know KEG? Well, KEG is the first digitized database for metabolic pathways where they captured the enzyme commission numbers and um, the pathways in which those enzymes fitted and digitized them. So it has a vast repository of, of metabolic reactions and networks of reactions that go together with pathways. And it's used as the, the resource for pretty well all metabolic models that are built use KEG, or some at least data that have been drawn from KEG and supplemented by others. So it's the repository for metabolic pathways and enzymes. Brenda is a very, very nice in-depth database of enzymes where it will tell you for you need an EC number to go in it once you're in there it'll compile the kinetic values that have been published for this enzyme substrates and alternative substrates molecular masses has it been cloned what are its inhibitors it's really really good digest of all the literature and it's linked out to the literature so now I mean this is where you go if you don't know anything about an enzyme this is where you go to find out what would take you days to find manually? Yeah, comparative genomics resources, 
we're going to go to see Stitch is really very promising. This incorporates small molecules into the sort of the string. And I've used it a couple of times and I've found, yes, it finds the same small molecule relationships that I could predict manually. It also finds a lot of noise because, for example, anytime you do a structure, you have selenomethionine that's put in there to do the phasing. So you'll also have, you'll have selenomet pretty much associated with every gene. But it, that's noise. That's not real. So you have to know a bit your small molecules. Yeah, but it's it's the way it's the field is moving. It's trying to explore. Selenomethionine. Well, that's used as a substituent for methionine. Substituent for methionine to do the phasing. Yeah, and then many many proteins have got glycerol or any yeah. yeah. bound to them, yeah. and that that will show up as yeah. an association. But but I say that because I had a exercise for my grad student, and they did a whole theory about my protein being involved in selenomethionine metabolism based on that. So it's something you have to. Yeah, Microbes Online has very nice features. It doesn't have eukaryotes. Phylogenetic distribution tools. Do you want to say a little yeah, bit about Yeah, so that we're going to look at the JGI one in a later exercise. But actually, in my last two workshops, this didn't work at all. So I also showed them the other ones because the JGI was down. And I don't know if it's been up again or not. So these are three different platforms that allow you to search for proteins that follow a specific profile. Each has their pros and cons. The JGI is the clunkier to use. It's really a pain, but it's the one with the most genomes. So sometimes you don't have the choice but to use JGI. The microbes online is actually the most easy to use, except if you start from the normal microbes online page, you can never find this page. That's why I give you this link, because if you don't have this link, you can't find the page. I read the whole 500 pages of tutorial to find it. So, and microscope is quite easy to, to use also, but it doesn't have as many genomes. And I, what I do is I always use at least two of those when I'm looking for something, because they do give you slightly different results. Yeah, I guess it's worth saying in connection with phylogenetic distribution tools, the phylogenetic distribution you start with doesn't have to be of a gene. It can be of the end product. Yes. But if you know a product is only made in certain taxa, then you put that distribution in as this is the gene I'm looking for that's going to track that distribution. So it's not only for genes that can use kind of a conceptual input of a characteristic that's, that the organism has. Okay. Which database does the gene of protein expression in different tissues? To do transcriptomics? Oh, tra we're yeah. coming to transcriptomics. Yeah. So the you have them the under very next okay. one. Okay. Transcriptome databases, these are so far mostly microarray based with the exception of QTELA which is RNA-seq and enormously better. But my favorites are the GOLM transcriptome database, that's where my data that I showed mm -hmm. came from, Monica. And ATED which is a Japanese site and this is excellent at looking for co-expression patterns most of these sites will give you a list of gene correlations. So you put in a search gene and say, you ask it over the different organs and environmental conditions, which genes correlate with this best, and they'll give you a list. ATED goes further than that. It implements something much more like what they call a bidirectional best hit in BLAST. You know, bidirectional best hit is where you have a gene in one organism you blast it against another organism and you get a hit. You then take that one and blast it back against the first organism and if in both cases they're the best hit, that's a crude criterion for them being the same function. Very crude. If you gasp back with the second gene and it's nowhere near the best hit, it means no, it's probably not the same function. Well, you can do something like that with transcriptomes. That if this gene is highly correlated or correlated, not even highly, is correlated with that gene in that direction and it's like the top three on the list of correlations and we take this one and go back and it's also in the top three, that gives you the basis for making a network based on these reciprocal relationships, not just one way. So it builds very nice networks. You can kind of build your own but there's always a network that you can get easily around any one gene of interest 
and that can provide clues to what might be uh, functionally related genes. I don't think that's been, I don't think anything does it better than that did at the moment. And then there are a whole bunch of others that do similar things. The bottom q teller, this is just for grasses at the moment, but it's the first of the wave of RNA-seq data, which are hugely richer because they... Um, they're deeper. They're, well, they're deeper, they do a lot more sequencing, but they also have a better detection threshold. So genes like for vitamins and hormones, these tend to be not expressed strongly, and they can be in the noise of um, microarrays. Micro and they've emerged from the noise with... For bacteria, I have, to, I have to add Patrick here because in the last year they really improved a lot their microarray analysis, so I'll, I'll update that. Because we're kind of at least a little bit plant-oriented, these are some of the plant phenome, i.e. high-throughput phenotyping databases. Seed genes, chloroplast 2010, which is a nightmare to use, but they knock genes out and determine phenotypes. In the case of chloroplast 2010, it's even a little bit of biochemistry. They do amino acid and starch analysis, lipid. Very important plant proteome databases. These are the two gold standards. These are repositories of self, i.e. the researchers who built the database, and literature, MS, mass spec, proteomic, information plus sometimes targeting done with green fluorescent protein and they integrate all the information that's available for particular genes in Arabidopsis and to some extent maize. So these are really good sites to go for experimental evidence of protein localization. And then lastly, well I don't quite know what to say about these, these unknown gene and unknown enzyme databases, Arenza and Adomata both, well, they do a useful job in cataloging orphan enzymes. They both do that. But what I do, if I have a, an EC number, the first thing I do is go to Arenza and ask, is this a, an orphan? Because it's actually quite hard to find that information <laughs> manually. In other words, does it not have a gene? Yeah. Otherwise, on keg, there's no protein associated. That's by default. Oh, yeah. I guess that would work, too. That's how I found it.